Hello everyone, this is Nathan Voss, director of the picture. Um, so starting off with small text here uh, for the titles, I actually hope, I wonder if that text is small enough, um, is because uh, it creates the illusion of, a, you know what, I'm going to pause this, a bunch of stuff I want to say about this opening shot, if that's all right. Yeah, the reason for small text is, uh, of course, it creates the illusion of a larger image, uh, regardless of the device that you happen to be watching the film on. Hopefully that's a large screen of sorts. But um, yeah, it makes the image feel bigger by starting off with small text, sort of focuses the eye and attenuates it to details. As far as this opening shot here, a couple things I briefly want to say about it before moving forward. We want to establish from whose perspective uh, we would like the audience to see this, the events of this narrative. Setting her up as the protagonist, uh, Eleanor here, because it's not immediately apparent by way of dialogue, who the main character of this piece is, because she doesn't speak for very much of the first half of the picture. Um, and, and we want to let the audience know, okay, this is how we're entering into the, the narrative here. This is who we're seeing the events take place uh, from, from her perspective. Also, just uh, photographically, I, I like the image because um, my training is photography and cinematography. I shot this film myself, and we... Um, I get excited by things like the Rembrandt triangle uh, from painting on her, uh, the, the lighting on her left cheek there and the, free, and the three quarter lighting. Also, it's an image of a figure in a state of repose um, in thought. And that's important to me because cinema is an inherently exterior medium. It's good at showing external change. And uh, I am most impressed with films that attempt to articulate an internal psychological shift and that is what this film is attempting to do by starting off by showing a character in thought. Hopefully we're intimating to the audience that uh, that's one of our goals here. Also, um, we, we sort of use the uh, left corner of the frame to suggest that there's another figure. Um, easier to do that in motion picture photography than still photography where that might otherwise be interpreted uh, as an unimportant um, block of object. But we can see that it's someone's shoulder here. Moving right along, I wanted to start this with um, more or less silence because there's just so much talking in this bloody film. And uh, also, you know, I'm, I'm going to pause this again really fast. Um, there are a couple things about this uh, moment here that just pain me. One is the audio. Um, these are the first moments that we hear the characters speak. And uh, this is a less than ideal recording of them doing so. That pains me because it's the very first opportunity the audience has to hear people speaking, and we risk losing them by implying that the entirety of this movie is going to have a low audio quality. That used to be the case. Um, we have sensed, uh, myself and uh, some really terrific people who I've been working with, have since remastered the audio on this picture. Uh, however, if source audio is problematic, there's only so much you can do, as uh, any audio engineer listening to this will know. And uh, therefore, this um, there's a little bit of fuzz in this uh, exchange here. Gosh, that bothers me. And um, me being the, the uh, perfectionist that I am. Also, photographically, I uh, am, a little, am a little disappointed that the focus point of this is not on their faces, but on the um, windowsill over there, which is not crucial. <laughs> to thematically what's taking place in this uh, shot. Despite those points, none of those things are as important as the fact that the performative quality of the actors here is dramatically, it's by far the best of the takes we happen to do of this exchange. We try to establish the relationship between these two characters in a very short amount of time in this uh, early opening section. And so their acting completely trumps, you know, whether or not windowsills are in focus or whether or not, you know, the audio is perfect. The uh, various people I've tested this with and shown um, don't even comment on that the opening lines of the movie are a little bit fuzzy, you know, or that. So I'm, I'm trusting that. If 8% of the people who watch this are skilled audio engineers and are pulling their hair out, um, as I do <laughs> when I watch this, um, I think that's okay. If, uh, if everyone else, and hopefully them as well, are getting some of the emotional import uh, implied here. We, uh, I, I do tend to shoot a lot of footage. I care a lot about performance. And uh, there is plenty of other material of, these, uh, of this exchange that would have been serviceable and probably better in terms of visual and audio uh, concerns. However, uh, again, as I said, the acting quality is important. Also, 
It's important to me that this is a two shot. We want them to share the frame to visually suggest the intimacy of their relationship. I want there to be a psychological justification for every shot and cut. Um, and I like to think that we can do that for the entirety of this film. For example, we cut here to the very next scene, uh, also, or next shot, excuse me, also a two shot of the two of them. Why did we cut to that wide uh, for just a moment there? Because I liked what was going on with her hands. There's a sort of affectionate uh, truthfulness in that. Also, it allows us to start introducing sound image discontinuities. That's something I we can just say that I outright stole from watching and loving pictures by Steve Soderbergh and Oliver Stone, uh, both of them not afraid to experiment with the medium. Uh, I think Michael Mann has done this a little bit too, but it's, um, it's this idea of separating image and sound as a way of really waking up the viewer. It's typically not expected. We are pretty inured to elliptical edits now. You see them everywhere from, you know, not just Godard, but, um, you know, reality TV does it now. And um, that visual language is not surprising. What is surprising is uh, breaks uh, between image and sound continuity. The reason we want to do that in this movie is to uh, emphasize that uh, her state of mind is fragmented, sort of broken, and wouldn't it make sense for the uh, aesthetics of the film to be the same? Later on, when she, later in the movie, delivers that big monologue, there's no more need for jump cuts and fragmenting the form because her mental state is no longer uh, in, a, in a fractured state. So we stopped doing that at that point. Um, okay, why are we pausing on this particular shot here? Gosh, it's uh, one that I'm not too terribly happy with for myself. I'm speaking strictly photographically here because it's front lit and front lighting is not my favorite. Also, we were using a different setting on this particular day, uh, which didn't have quite as much range and tonality, especially on the warmer end of the spectrum. The red of her um, shirt, uh, or blouse, I suppose I should say. Um, but uh, again, the, the reason for using this shot is because the acting is excellent, uh, if I may say so. The, again, the, the stuff that's going on with her hands and, her, and Eleanor's very gestural uh, truthfulness and Ryan's, you know, this uh, reactive nature in that uh, shot where he's uh, putting to action the idea that listening is much more than a passive act. I like this because of the way the light is hitting them and this sort of back and forth. And, and we're moving the camera closer in on them because it's, we want to be thinking about intimacy here. And if we think of the, the camera as a third sort of player, a third dance partner, uh, to a scene involving two scene partners. I think that's important. And then we sort of break this as Mr. John Fantasia. I use I use character names when we're shooting on set, but somehow I lapse back into using the actor's real names. So that's uh, John Fantasia playing bits in Arsenal. He walks in there and we try to suggest indicators of status, implying that those things are important to him. Uh, we have Ryan rolling his eyes there on uh, frame right, and that's because we want that to be a sort of audience entry point. Uh, this is a way to react. This is a possible choice for the audience to react to... Um, John's antics here because it's it is theatrical it is stylized and somewhat ridiculous it's it is in conflict to the naturalistic quality of performing and also very warm intimate uh, relation between the two characters we've been spending time with so far and uh, Ryan's eye rolling is a way for not just those two characters but also us uh, to respond. I held on this shot of blue and red for just an extra second. Half the reason for that uh, in the movie is just because it counterbalances the sheer amount of warm tones in this movie. So very briefly I want to talk about how it may seem a little hubristic. I'm going to pause this again. Gosh, you guys, there's so much stuff I want to share. Thanks for listening to this. The, the reason we, we cut to black there briefly um, I uh, want to backtrack a little bit and say that right now it's 2016. I'm recording this in 2016. The uh, script for this was written in 2008. We shot it in 2009, edited in 2010, and uh, screened it, um, a 38-minute version of this, in early 2011 at the Henry Art Gallery. I was happy with the film, but I was never completely satisfied with my own... Uh, ability to structure and organize the piece. I sort of wrestled with that for a long time. I don't want to imply the uh, ridiculous sort of hubris of working on a short film for whatever that is, eight years. There's a long break in there where, where I just sort of moved on to other projects, uh, traveled to eight countries, made another film, ran a wedding photography business, had a bunch of gallery shows, designed a book and a couple album covers, started a blog that was ended up being much larger than I thought it would be. But uh, during all of that time, 
periodically tinkered with it, but uh, never quite felt completely satisfied, and then woke up about a year ago with this burst of inspiration. All of you artists listening to this will know that inspiration works in ways that uh, can hardly be defined. Uh, you know, the, the whole thing where you're brushing your teeth on a Tuesday and all of a sudden you go write 500 pages. And uh, working with a, a good friend of mine who has some background editing, uh, interestingly, not film editing, but on the writing side, he's a very good friend of mine, Brian Job, uh, author, teacher, professor, lecturer, poet, um, and screenwriter, with uh, an extensive um, knowledge and understanding of film. We talk about films basically constantly. Completely reorganized the uh, film here and uh, went back to the raw footage. We have new technology that can address some issues of overexposure that I'll talk about later, allowing us to use shots we previously didn't think were possible. And also, um, you know, I was just not as good a director and editor in 2010 uh, as I like to think I am now. And we're able to make just more intelligent decisions of uh, brevity and also making cohesive uh, a, some disparity in acting styles in this film, and also emphasizing Eleanor to a greater degree. A third and crucial element was uh, redoing the sound. The sound mix for this new cut uh, is not perfect, but the difference is pretty astronomical. There was so much clipping and peaking, uh, echo from overlap and so on, and flatness and lack of directionality to the other mix, and I'm not attributing those to the former editor who was very willing to work with some pretty difficult material, but um, to my own lack of expertise in the field, um, I've since taught myself a little bit of rudimentary understanding of sound, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, my background is more in images. And so being able to uh, address some sound issues has been really satisfying on a technical level, but also I think it helps narratively. It's easier to enter the film if um, you're not distracted by the artificiality of, of peaking and distortion or the more basic thing of not being able to understand what the characters are saying especially in this dialogue-heavy picture. Okay, so the reason um, I paused this here is because we had a frame of black earlier, right before the uh, commencing of this scene. That's because there's a pretty big chunk of material we cut out, which is totally unnecessary, that helped further flesh out the John Fantasia character, the gentleman in the red suit there, the ex-husband. It made clear the emotional dynamics of these three individuals very early on, and the idea now is to have that reveal itself a little more slowly over the picture and not do this thing where we're immediately repulsed by John Fantasia, who made some, by Vincent Arsenault, the character, excuse me, who makes some uh, remarks that are so offensive in the material that I cut out here that it kind of throws things off balance and leaves a sour taste in the viewer's mouth. Not necessary. Moving right along, we accelerate the editing pace a little here introducing more characters and therefore more dynamics and more sort of um, spiderweb connections between what's going on with these characters. The the thing they're talking about now, have a drink on my um, birthday here, is mildly connected to some material that got cut. I hope it still makes sense. John was regaling them with tales of the airplane ride over to this home, which he found distasteful, and uh, that has led to a sort of winding uh, exchange of um, comments and insults. John is, his character feels very insecure because he's the ex-husband and he used to live in this home, but now he's a stranger in it. And he tries to cover that up with um, macho alpha male masculine dominance as if to assert his greater masculinity over Mr. Ryan, the new husband, or the actor playing the new husband, excuse me. We uh, reordered some shots in this scene and moved some very small noises around. The O by Vincent there, the um, eye exchange, and the sort of gesture that Eleanor does with her fingers, a uh, sort of silent communication with Ryan as if to say, uh, no need to interfere. I do. I, I got this, uh, although it may not seem so. Um, this is a new shot we're looking at here that was introduced into this new cut of the movie, replacing a reverse shot of the same action uh, that was a little too demonstrative. It had uh, John Fantasia sucking on his index finger, you know, innuendo style, and grossing Eleanor out. Brian Joe my uh, consulting editor here, pointed out correctly, I believe, that um, we don't need to see that. And we get more out of Eleanor's reaction to whatever it is John's doing. We now no longer know that he's sucking on his index finger unless we're listening carefully to that little 
sucking noise, which we carefully reinserted into this shot. Um, yeah, 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 we get more out of the fact that Eleanor can hardly even look at this guy. I find that a little more useful, and also there's more depth in that frame. Emphasizing near and far within the uh, same frame is something I wanted to do a lot, and something that I think is valuable in any film, because film you know, it's a two-dimensional visual format. Uh, in my opinion, you just, you can't have a whole bunch of action parallel to the picture plane for the entire movie. Uh, the whole uh, tableau vivant look, uh, it can be quite beautiful, but only if used sparingly. Um, you just can't run that for a whole picture. The audience is going to fall asleep 10 minutes into the movie. But also, uh, we wanted to do um, deep focus for this movie and have uh, wide-angle lenses for the whole thing because... One, we're hearkening back to an earlier tradition of, you know, the talkie. This is a movie where, you know, stuff is, uh, there's huge amounts of dialogue. And we want to make the visuals interesting. We, we, we want things to be dynamic and not just have uh, one thing to look at. And that's why the wide frame, instead of just, uh, you know, academy ratio or flat ratio, going for the full scope ratio here uh, to make it feel more expansive. Yes, it's, it's a claustrophobic uh, piece because it's only in three rooms, but um, we don't want the viewer to feel too too hemmed in. We want them to have stuff to look around at. Also, uh, deep focus because the character is an actualization, uh, the home, excuse me, is, is, is an actualization of the characters who live in it. And um, we're uh, developing character by allowing the viewer to, you know, look at all the stuff on the walls and infer that uh, Eleanor and Ryan are these um, kind of art, uh, intellectual, hippie, you're, types, among other things. Uh, a couple of movement things I liked doing there. Um, I don't know how interesting this is for viewers who are not photographers or cinematographers, but the, the swooping camera on, on both women there a moment ago was something that I liked because it implied a synergy and hopefully a connection between the, the two women who are involved in this um, scene with a bunch of males and hopefully a silent, an unspoken connection, however slight, that might make Eleanor feel a little more comfortable. Uh, a bunch of jump cuts here to sort of establish the scene quickly, lay out the, the geography of the room and the camaraderie between the two agents there with the cup being set down on the cup holder. Uh, now we have uh, Devin, very great, great, well-trained actor. Um, she's basically reeling off some exposition. John reacts here with a line, uh, who is she talking to? And that's sort of an inside joke. She's, of course, talking to the audience because everyone in this room would be aware of the stuff she's saying. I really hate exposition, and I like to, to cut it as much out of the movie as possible. That's why we never verbalize, you know, who's the ex-husband, who's the new husband, who, who was married to who, uh, what are they even talking about in this bloody scene, you know, whose daughter went missing and all this. I hope all that information becomes gradually clear in the manner that it would if you were, you know, standing over these guys' shoulders for two hours and you sort of got, uh, or in this case, 27 minutes, and sort of got the gist of what was happening. I, I enjoy cutting out exposition because it's this end media res thing where it forces the viewer to dive in and pay a lot of attention. We do expect a lot from the viewer in this. I feel audiences are pretty darn intelligent, and uh, when you make something that asks them to use that intelligence, I like to think that it causes them to sort of live up to that expectation. If you make something designed uh, for the lowest common denominator, then audiences will live down to that lack of requirement. But people have been watching movies for, um, you know, uh, more than a century now, and visual grammar has been pretty clear, uh, clearly established. Ways of narrative storytelling, I think people can figure out what's going on in this movie, uh, watching it one or two times. But we do have to have Devin laying out that stuff about who these two agents are. That is just a little too much to ask in terms of um, they're just not going to know that. The audience isn't. I like to rehearse with actors. We spend a lot of time. I guess I can play this. Um, you know what? I want to pause this again briefly. Um, thanks for bearing with me. And tell you that uh, that moment there is another of these intentional sound discontinuities. She says, uh, she's your daughter too, and we have a shot here of her not speaking, but just in a visual pose of exasperation and lack of understanding of John's flippant attitude. Again, it's an effort to sort of wake up the viewer, get him to pay attention, you know, oh, there was something slightly off, what happened there? Uh, I'm not trying to say that that's an entirely successful thing. I think I should have done either more of these or none of them in this film because it's not immediately clear. I like to think that there's enough of these to make clear that they're not mistakes. They're all over the movie, and maybe they're more apparent as one watches it further, more and more times. But, uh, I, yeah, I have gotten feedback where it's like, oh gosh, you made a couple of mistakes there. And I kind of felt like, um, 
how Thelma Schoonmaker, excuse me, Martin Scorsese's famous editor, felt after the movie Goodfellas. She was uh, backstage at the Academy Awards when Goodfellas lost to Dances with Wolves, and Kevin Costner or somebody associated with uh, Wolves came over and told Thelma, you know, uh, Goodfellas was really good. I like the movie quite a bit, but gosh, there's so many continuity errors in that thing. And Thelma had to reply, you know, we, we, we do that all the time. That's intentional. We, we care more about the emotion, emotional reality of the scene than the physical reality of the scene. And if preserving the physical reality means having shots go on forever so we're not uh, doing jump cuts, we're just going to make the audience go to sleep. And um, I really respect that willingness to uh, foreground emotional and psychological matters over uh, something as uh, prosaic as continuity. I like to think that's what we're accomplishing to some degree of success here. Um, yeah. Yeah, and so we have John basically derailing this, uh, what's supposed to be a kind of a fruitful back and forth where the agents are trying to gather more information, searching for the missing child, missing and possibly dead child, uh, teenage daughter of Eleanor and John's characters here. That's why John has to be at the home. Uh, he doesn't want to be here, but he's required to because uh, naturally as a father, he's involved in the search for this child. Right there, we have, I'm going to pause this again. We show Eleanor uh, turning her head to look at John two times. Um, there, I like to repeat actions sometimes in order to emphasize them. Um, an example, I guess, would be, uh, uh, taxi driver, Martin Scorsese, he crossed his alls from Bob De Niro walking down the street to Bob De Niro walking down the street and emphasizes loneliness in the case of that movie. Here, I hope it emphasizes, um, Eleanor's exasperation. Rather than have her overact that moment, uh, we should we show two takes of it, um, sort of breaking from physical reality once again to emphasize emotional reality. This was shot in a different manner than the rest of the film. This scene, I just asked them to run the entire scene while I moved about the room, grabbing footage, uh, documentary style. I thought that would be appropriate because the, in terms of dialogue, the scene is pretty chaotic. There's a lot of different little mini threads, like there, John, what is he even talking about with the K in the New Orleans? That's not resonating with the other characters. Um, or if it is, like Ryan there is not finding it very funny. Uh, Devin and Marty, the actors playing those agents, are probably just more confused and overwhelmed than anything else. I, imagine that they are accustomed to working with cooperative people. The point of the scene is to try to condense what it would feel like for Eleanor to be married to John for 20 odd years, uh, 16 to 20 years, uh, in one scene for the audience. Um, I, w I mentioned earlier uh, rehearsing with the actors. Uh, we, we spent a lot of time on rehearsal because I wanted the characters to know, I wanted the actors to know the full backstory of all these characters. We have stuff going on about um, how uh, Vincent and Catherine met, John and Eleanor, if you will, why they were initially attracted to each other, how that marriage uh, worked for the brief time that it did, what happened, why the teenage daughter went astray. The audience doesn't get clued into any of that. I don't think that's important, though. I think it's important that the actors know that and that they can psychologically just communicate that to the audience who's sort of diving in in media res and trying to figure this out as they go. The equivalent, I guess, would be um, in Michael Mann. He had, uh, for collateral, having Tom Cruise learn how to do all these uh, tactical weapons training, assassin, you know, training with guns and stuff that he doesn't even use in the movie. Uh, same thing with Mark Ruffalo, uh, also in that film, was uh, similarly trained on a bunch of like police detective stuff that his character never does. But Mann justified that in the sense of, you know, it's so that Mark Ruffalo can walk in a certain walk and know how to do things and have that emotional truth be there in his performance. Michael Mann is uh, highly regarded across the pond, as it were. He's um, he trained in uh, London, and maybe that he's he's regarded much more of, as an auteur over there, uh, in a way that he isn't over here. Uh, not sure why. Maybe because his stuff is steeped a little more heavily in genre than um, more regularly revered auteurs over here stateside. Over there, he's got antecedents like Melville and um, actually Louis Maul, uh, for reasons we can talk about later. But I guess here, you know, there's uh, Peckinpah and um, other people. Scorsese would be an obvious example. I, I'm not sure why people don't revere 
Michael Mann here in the States. He is, there's a lot you can learn from, especially because of his tendency towards uh, interior or introspective characters necessitating emphasis on composition and translating ideas through images rather than words in the tradition of pure cinema. So um, I'm not expecting the audience to sympathize with John here uh, for this film, I mean, as a whole. He, um, briefly, I want to, ex he jokes, he's joking about Basharat DeLuca. That is a reference to some stuff that got cut out. I like to think it still holds in this scene because he's trying to make a joke that nobody in the room finds funny. We, it's impossible for us to find it funny because we no longer know it's what it's referring to. We've cut out the scene uh, from which it stems. And uh, I hope that's okay. It's a little disorienting, but then so is much of the rest of this on first viewing. I like art that reveals itself slowly and I'm not trying to sit here and say that, you know, this movie is a friggin' masterpiece, but I do want to share that it's it's designed to be taken in more than once. And in my photography, I like to create photos that people will want to look at, you know, for more than five seconds. And similarly, the idea is the same for films. You know, you want to make something people, for some reason or another, want to come back to. Going back to John being a sympathetic character. So obviously he is not a sympathetic character by and large, but when he's standing up here by himself, I hope we can tell that he's hurt. He feels out of place. He There was a time when he was in love with this woman, and vice versa. And he probably used to tell her these, you know, highfalutin intellectual jokes that were a source of amusement for both of them. And uh, here he is, hurting. And this is one of those things where, you know, the 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 bad guy thinks he's the good guy. And from his perspective, he's the good guy. And who are these people who have turned on him so? And he's lost his daughter. He's uh, he's lost his uh, his family as a, as a whole. And he's been replaced by this, you know, newer and better sort of version B with this good-looking guy over there, uh, played by Ryan. Um, and that's why we spend time over here with John in the other corner of the room with the camera. Even though he's not saying anything and there's more dialogue happening over there, I want us to not entirely hate this guy. I want us to recognize that um, there is some emotion buried underneath this thick fa fa facade which he presents, and here he comes back doing, uh, you know, trying to hurt others to cover up his own pain. And he's, he's sort of twisting the knife here. I don't know if he expects Ryan to um, react physically. One of Ryan's first uh, things when he we were talking about this script years ago was, you know, why the heck doesn't my character just beat this guy up? Uh, <laughs> um, and that's another justification for the first scene. Uh, the first scene is where Eleanor basically says, I want to handle this myself. You know, I, I, I can do this. This is important for me to sort of exorcise on my own. And that's why Ryan is not currently, um, you know, kicking this guy out the door. Although that would not be an entirely unexpected response. In, in this exchange here, uh, he says, uh, uh, Marty says his name is um, Herbert Zarkovich, and then right after uh, Vincent has called him Orville, which Vincent thinks is a funny name, I think a lot of the stuff Vincent says is pretty funny. Um, that may just be my um, problematic sense of humor. Um, Vincent doesn't play the, John doesn't play the lines for humor, but um, I do think a lot of the lines he says are kind of amusing. He's, he's making fun of this, this agent by calling him Orville because he thinks that's a silly name. And then to discover that the guy's actual name is Herbert Zarkovich, um, which I think is an even funnier name than Orville is, is uh, what's going on there. Um, but it also allows Vincent to, you know, keep shoving his barbs around. I like the look on Marty's face there where he, he was registering Eleanor's uh, pain and doing a bang-up job of it. Marty and uh, I kind of wish those roles were bigger because Marty and Devin are hugely accomplished people um, with significant filmographies and careers on stage. Uh, as are all the actors here. These are really well vetted people that I love. But um, yeah, Marty's ability there to be this in this business work mode, largely a stranger to Eleanor, and yet recognizing the, the uh, human element, which he, I'm sure he can sympathize with. So there's this exchange here of um, Byron and Tennyson and stuff. This is Ryan trying to play John at his own game. John's throwing out literary quotes left and right because he knows that none of these people, you know, are probably familiar with uh, Tennyson and all these, you know, whoever else. 
Auden. And so Ryan, who is no slouch himself uh, intellectually, I, I gosh, I keep saying Ryan. Um, please understand, I'm referring to the characters here, not the actual people. Of course, all these people are, are intellectually capable as human beings. I'm referring to the actors. The character that Ryan is playing, uh, Richard Kenyon, is written to be intellectually capable enough to, you know, he's a smart guy. He knows who, um, he knows Byron. And so he says uh, he wants to call Vincent out and say, um, look, I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm well read too. I, I can see through your game here. I can see that you're quoting Byron. Unfortunately, he is not quite as um, academically inclined as John is. And John says, you know, this is actually Tennyson. Let me uh, twist the knife in a little further. I'm pausing this again because I briefly want to make a note of that, that mug he was drinking out of that shot of him drinking a mug there, this wide shot, following, immediately following the shot of Marty doing the very same, drinking out of his own mug. And that's be that's a sort of uh, this, like, masculine thing. It's this mirroring thing, but it's also this, you know, this guy thing where they're both, uh, I don't know, downing their mugs or something. Um, it's kind of hard to verbalize that, but it's, it's to imply a connection there, solidarity against the big angry guy in red. Fanta jo John Fantasia's character is just loving this because he gets to go on about Tennyson for a little more and uh, lord his intellectual wisdom over them all, uh, as Catherine later phrases. The house is a real location. It's um, these walls which coordinate so well with the color of the actor's clothing. Yeah, we did not dress this set very much. Uh, these are real, re real home, intricately decorated, amazingly analogous to the uh, artistic lifestyle and also emotional plight of um, the character Eleanor plays. So we have this thing where Eleanor uh, exits. That's a jump cut there where we eliminated some acting that was perhaps less than great, entirely due to my own substandard direction there. I did not articulate with enough clarity what I wanted out of this scene. There's this conflict of acting styles between the two of them. There's uh, that unfinished sentence that she says that I didn't go enough detail into what the emotional thrust of that sentence is and how it would have ended had her character had the strength to say it. Uh, so I have to take complete blame for how this, uh, for how that moment is and why it's cut out. I think it works as is. So we have um, Catherine exits to go spend some time on her own because she's exhausted by all this. This is a reorganization of uh, the screenplay. Earlier, this sort of reminiscing took place when she was similarly exasperated during the scene uh, that we cut out earlier that took place in that little uh, breakfast uh, dining room area. Uh, now it's much later in the movie, and I think it makes more sense because A, we're just avoiding the repetition of multiple scenes of Catherine getting exasperated. Here we just have the one, and we use this to hopefully greater dramatic effect. Um, and also it allows us to uh, get out of the room for a little bit, um, get out of all that talking and do some communicating uh, more explicitly through visual terms. That right there is supposed to be a former area where a frame, a picture frame hung. I hope that's apparent. The images actually are of the actress, Eleanor Mosley's real uh, daughters. In the film, they stand in for her character's daughter. Uh, just wanted to give a face to the name that they're talking about and that they attach so much importance to. Um, I mentioned that this little montage here is an opportunity to communicate visually. I like to think that the rest of the movie is doing that as well, as we talked about um, choosing shots uh, to establish points of view and framing and having characters uh, uh, dominate the frame if they're supposed to be dominating the story. For example, we're always, usually we're angled up on John, we're looking up at him, which I think just thematically makes sense because he's, you know, this domineering figure, so on and so forth. This sort of clever inter-editing as we get back to the room was entirely manufactured in the editing room. This is not how this uh, scene was built originally, but I think um, it works a lot better. And now Ryan is starting to sort of react. Eleanor's not in the room anymore, so he can sort of get in there and react as he might like. Uh, this visual exchange here, we have this uh, sort of backlit silhouette of John followed by that, the very same with Ryan. Um, as a photographer, I just love stuff like that. I don't know if if this little visual exchange here has any resonance. Um, 
I hope it does, but for me, I just adore having, you know, two backlit silhouette shots happening, appearing to happen largely by accident. I get excited about this stuff, and I hope that it's visually resonating with the audience on some level, uh, uh, if only subconsciously. This pair of shots is also, of course, setting up these two more firmly visually as antagonists who are, you know, who want to square off or who may square off, anticipating um, their next verbal exchange in the next scene. The uh, the montage that we recently had where we're flying all over the house, it's not intended to be memories. Some viewers have told me that that's how they see it, which is okay with me. And uh, as they exit, we come back for just a little bit of breathing room after all that uh, overloaded dialogue and kind of difficult dialogue to work with because uh, A, they're talking about action that is other than what's going on in the room, and B, the emotional back and forth of the scene we just watched is of greater importance to me than the literality of what they're saying. And in the editing room, uh, in this recent re-edit, recut, uh, Brian and I, Brian Job and I, uh, actually built, rebuilt the whole scene as a montage, as another montage, sort of a two-hander along with the, uh, musical montage we just saw of Eleanor in repose. We had the yelling scene that we just saw of everyone talking and getting angry at John and all this and vice versa. As another montage which was drowned out largely with music and we had uh, Justin Swan, excellent composer friend of mine, write brand new music for it. I don't think he's going to be very happy that we didn't use any of it. Although we did replace the score at the very opening of the movie with new score that runs for longer and in my opinion, is more appropriate. But as far as this scene, um, uh, sorry, Justin, if you're hearing this, um, but it's because um, once we cut that together, it seemed a little too gimmick heavy, a little too much of, okay, they're spending too long in the editing room and playing around with all these tricks and toys and turning this into some avant-garde thing where music is being laid over people talking, can't even hear what they're saying. The original idea was, we don't need to hear what they're saying. The stuff they're saying, the, the, you know, Byron, Tennyson, this is not important um, to get every single word they're picking up. I just want the audience to get the emotional thing. John's angry. Eleanor can't break free. Uh, Ryan wants to do something but can't. Those can be, those can be communicated largely just by way of images and music. And I thought, let's just go all out and uh, do that. And had this great piece of music. He wrote a couple of different, uh, several different pieces, excuse me, a couple of which were extremely great and effective, but in the end it was a little too um, relying on tricks and aesthetics over form. It seemed to be this like, okay, it's this some young director who's really high on experimental stuff and what are we looking at? It doesn't make any sense. Rather than this, um, you know, Bergman emotionally lacerating dialogue that uh, the audience can barely uh, keep up with the first time they see it. I much prefer that. I would rather give the audience this ridiculous overload of information so that they can parse it out later than uh, this, like, you know, film school looking thing of the, some young director guy going crazy with um, the filmic equivalent of Photoshop. So now in this exchange here, we do have Ryan finally get to uh, fight back, as it were. This is not in the um, Joan Didion... Okay, so this, this film is adapted from a couple of chapters of a Joan Didion novel and other elements of the same novel that have been uh, reorganized and tied together. Legally, this is uh, allowed under fair use because it fits the legal definition of a parody, um, which is not... A sort of, which is not a humor thing, but a, a reevaluation thing. And some of that is explained in the end credits of this movie, the uh, legal elements. But um, no, I, um, we, we, we just basically moved around a lot of thematic elements of that book, A Book of Common Prayer by Joan Didion. I just had very different things I wanted to say than she does. Her, that's an excellent book, but it's got different aims and uh, some beautiful dialogue. A lot of the dialogue in this movie, though, uh, is my own and does not come from the book. Uh, some of that, not least of which is the final monologue, is also here when Ryan uh, tells him off about this, uh, him pretending to know a bunch of Trotskyites. I, I think we, we needed to have this because 
it's just not conceivable or expected, I suppose, for the new husband to just basically, you know, bend over and not react to um, the manner in which this ex-husband is treating his wife. There is there is always an unspoken hierarchy involving people who have had affairs with the same woman or man, and that is coming to the fore here where Ryan feels the need to assert himself. He wasn't the, he wasn't the original guy, uh, but he believes himself to be a better guy. I'm generalizing there. Um, and so he, the character, he uh, lays down the law and calls out Vincent at his own game here, this time effectively. Also, it's like there, there just needed to be some more moments of Ryan's acting in this film. He's far too good an actor to be relegated to not having at least uh, this, mo this moment and a couple others. Because, man, he's good. That's part of the reason why we just, we stay on Ryan for this whole darn thing. We, we know what John's thinking. We can, we can intuit that by feeling the strength of what Ryan is imparting here. And I want to hold on Ryan, not just because his acting is so strong, but also emotionally. I'm interested in seeing this character's response to what we've just seen. And uh, that's more interesting to me than... John's response, which we go to in a more linear fashion, rather than cross-cutting, we just go to John here and stay with John, as he lets the impact of uh, Ryan's telling off sort of sink in. Again, spending some alone time with uh, uh, the unlikable character here, because he is human as well. Uh, this particular take was chosen because there's this lip quivering thing that John does towards the close of this that um, I was pretty darn happy with right there. You know, the cut to black as we uh, move on to this, I, I hope we've by now established that cuts to black in this movie imply breaks in time. And this is supposed to be a little later on the same day. Eleanor is exhausted. She's upstairs in her sort of her sacred quiet space. We don't establish whether this is a bedroom or not, um, or just sort of a... Uh, a study of sorts. I conceived of it as a study. Uh, largely undressed. We left this as is. The picture frame is our addition. That's the, the remnant of the picture frame you see up on frame left. Is something we put in. Everything else though, including that the cover of that Hans Memling book, uh, which I'm really happy is visually easy to pick up on. Uh, so we have John entering the space that we've previously only seen in that uh, mental montage that Miss Eleanor was having as her thoughts were roaming about the house. And I liked the, the visual conceit of John intruding on that space, on that mental space. This is a space we haven't seen in literal linear storytelling time yet, and he's like, he's walking into it quite literally. This is a new shot. We had an alternate shot of the very same exchange of dialogue, but in going back to raw footage, you know, it was, um, again, I was not as good a director in uh, however many years ago as I, I'm not going to say I'm a great director, but um, I, I was just not as good as one then, and I like to think I'm a little better, especially at doing selects. Now, and this, I think, just has better performative quality. Another reason we were able to do uh, uh, different takes is that we um, were able to use takes that we didn't think were usable uh, because of sound. There were some misunderstandings involving the uh, audio of this film, and some new information came to light that revealed that the very excellent on-set sound engineer, Tara Munoz, just did a fabulous job, uh, which I was not aware of uh, until much later, um, which I feel bad about. She did some killer work that is not has was never recognized until now. Uh, there were some just issues that uh, covered up otherwise excellent work of hers, and because her work was excellent, and now that we were able to see that and re-looking at the audio, we're able to use some different footage uh, that had better performative quality. What I like here is how the focus will go to Eleanor's hair, putting us more strongly on her side. We are visually already on her side because quite literally the camera is where she is. Uh, but I, I wanted to throw John even further out of uh, our frame of mind here and really get us in Eleanor's headspace, um, pushing John to the, cor the corner of the frame, having Eleanor just overwhelming it. And this turn of the head, that, that sort of head, not quite toss, but head toss of exasperation just works for me. Slightly different color balance for this shot. 
Hope it doesn't distract. I uh, used this shot instead of some other ones that had matching color balances to the other footage in the remainder of the scene because I like his uh, reaction to that frame on the wall. I like to think it um, used to be a family portrait of the two of them, including their daughter, and its absence has now become a presence. And uh, the way he registers that is just the right combination of uh, wistful and frustrated, which he then uh, somewhat childishly expresses in his outburst here in a moment, um, and uh, trash-talking the husband and so on. The, the pointing the cane was, it was a heck of a gesture, and I wanted to suggest it visually without showing it all the way. It'd just be a little too much to have some guy pointing a cane at somebody else in the same room as them. Um, but I like to think that just having that intimation in the corner of the frame uh, gets the idea across. His voice cracks um, a little when he yells, as he's just about to hear. We use this take for that reason, among others, um, because it reveals, you know, it's the child inside of him. The child is the father of the man, as they say, uh, and this, this hurt boy quality. Um, I, for one, like hot lighting. I'm one of these people who loves Robert Richardson and gets excited about creative, you know, over and under exposure. And we, and we do have some pretty hard lighting on for this whole movie. And, uh, I like that, you know, the detail in John's face is, I mean, it isn't even there. It's, it's just blasted into white. But, uh, the eye is drawn to the point of highest contrast. And I think that it's worth it, just as in, um, in, uh, real world photography, you often, you color correct for accuracy, whereas in cinema, you color correct for emotional truth, color correct for emotion. Same thing with exposure. We expose for emotion, not for, you know, is this a perfectly exposed image in, uh, technical terms? Absolutely not. But, um, I think it, it, it's better to uh, communicate the harshness of what's going on here with the tools of cinema that we have at our disposal. If we don't use those tools, we may as well be mounting this as a stage play. Another example of uh, possibly being over-creative is um, this uh, thing where we hear her say, I, go away, uh, and then she actually says it. That um, I hope the audience, I hope people get that uh, we're just trying to, you know, she's trying to say it. She's, she's saying it in her head. She builds up the nerve to say it out loud. And then we have another um, image sound discontinuity, the longest one coming up right here, where we've got John really taking that comment in, go away, while he's blabbing about something else. Um, he makes uh, actually a pretty astute comment here, um, separating the notion of life and lifestyle. He, um, the word lifestyle and the notion of defining oneself on uh, superficialities um, came into being only post-war, early 60s. Uh, when people had enough leisure time and surplus of income that they could afford to do so. Great book by Ted Goya, The Birth and Death of the Cool, that goes into somewhat exhaustive detail on that idea. And John's character is old enough um, to have registered that shift in his lifetime, or just barely old enough, I guess. So she says go away again, and then we have, um, we have some uh, screen direction things going on here where John is looking to frame left. A second ago, he was looking to frame right. Just another thing of throwing the audience off. Um, I believe we've established the spatial geography of this room well enough that the audience gets where John is standing, um, allowing us to get away with shot choices like that. So he chooses to approach uh, rather than go away, and we have that awesome thing he's doing with his finger there. Gosh, I love it. This uh, almost is this, you know, Nosferatu thing where the, the monster is coming closer, um, or vampire. And yes, it is supposed to be absurd. I changed the location to Milwaukee because it's more absurd. Who on earth would go with their ex-spouse to Milwaukee? No one. And the fact that John is unaware of that just sort of clues us into where he is mentally. There's a, there's a uh, jump cut to the same image here momentarily, right as Eleanor, um, has a sigh of disgust. Uh, and that's supposed to indicate a mental change. Um, there's a, there's a, there's a, a, f a mental flip that's happening in her head that moment where she realizes more than ever before, this is completely ridiculous. I need to stand up and um, explain why I feel that is. Both half to myself and half to uh, my ex-husband here. Again, we're exposing for Eleanor indoors, just ignoring the heck out of the, uh, a wildly blown out environment out there, probably making any number of photographers watching this pull their hair out. Sorry, guys. Uh, we did pull down the blind here because I didn't think it was necessary to do that type of stuff. 
for the dialogue exchange they're about to have in front of this window with the blinds on it. But I did want uh, a bunch of hard light coming in at the far end of the room. We uh, pull back into a two shot uh, for a different reason than we earlier had Ryan and Eleanor in a two shot at the beginning of the movie. No, these people, these two people are not um, romantically or otherwise in the same headspace. We're, we're doing this more as sort of a, a tableau type of thing where we're watching the two of them interact separated by a gulf of space, putting them on either end of the wide frame, uh, and also, of course, separated by that um, baggage of the past as made concrete by that empty frame or frame remnant there. In terms of um, guiding the audience's eye, though, I kind of wish I had bled the camera a little harder towards Eleanor here. Um, I want the audience right now to be looking at Eleanor's reaction, not at John figuring out his glasses, even though he's speaking. Yeah, I would have preferred that we were looking at Eleanor's face right now. Uh, Steve Soderbergh, for his remake of Solaris, he tried to do as much as possible shots of people listening instead of speaking, and it's an interesting visual experiment. It makes the movie seem quieter, even though it isn't, but also really gets us into the act of listening. Listening's a really big deal. Uh, very active activity. Too many actors, I think, will either overact or just, you know, go to sleep during shots where they're supposed to be listening. Uh, this, w this scene was blocked out very carefully. We, um, Total in total difference to the earlier scene in the blue room where I was running around grabbing footage, uh, Paul Greengrass style. This is more um, carefully blocking out everything, thinking about the emotional architecture of what's changing and shifting here between these two people. Um, I think it's the most successful scene in this film. It's also the longest. The uh, screenplay equally divided itself into three parts the uh, scene that we're watching now, immediately prior to it, the scene uh, in the blue room with the agents, and prior to that, the stuff in the sort of dining room uh, adjacent to the kitchen area. That has transformed into this situation where the first scene is now um, not more than a couple minutes, and then we spend about eight minutes with the agents, and then we've got half the movie, which is this final scene. I hope it's okay for the audience that we have a movie where the first half of it is happening at an accelerated pace and then we slow down. My hope here is that even though we're, we're, we're cutting a lot less in this scene, we're not moving as quickly, I hope that the emotional um, stuff, for lack of a better turn of phrase, is, uh, is more compelling, is most compelling by this point. We understand the connections between the characters now. Or if we don't, we get enough of them to comprehend what's going on here, and I think we can afford to slow down. It's become more interesting. We've been filling in gaps until now, and now uh, this is when the emotions are hopefully coming to the fore, and we're just, we the audience are hoping that Eleanor will just do something, you know? Um, she's been listening to this guy for 20 years, and we've been listening to him for 20 minutes, and we're already tired of him. This moment here, um, I guess I can play the movie. This moment here where she says, I have a lunch date. Earlier we were talking about Ryan playing Vincent at his own game. Ryan, the new husband, playing Vincent, the ex-husband. And first failing that and then succeeding. Here, this is Catherine doing the same. This is Catherine very successfully waiting for the right moment and then brilliantly, if I may say so, playing uh, Vincent at his own game. She says, I have a lunch date after he asks her to take a trip to Milwaukee. Now, a lunch date is, of course, no reason to cancel uh, something much larger, but that's exactly why this works. Um, Vincent has spent the entire movie being ridiculous and responding with non-answers. He starts talking about New Orleans. He doesn't take anyone seriously. This is Catherine for the very first time not taking his comment seriously. He, on the other hand, is opening up. He's he's making himself vulnerable by asking uh, her a favor. You know, do this with me. Um, I think he's still carrying some delusion that they can still get back together. People fall in love. I don't know that they fall out of love uh, as often as people think they do. And, uh, there's still a part of him that is... Um, Unable to forget the good parts of this uh, relationship as much as uh, has been ruined uh, by him. Um, 
And so, yeah, he's made himself vulnerable. That was a mistake. Catherine is taking advantage of that. And, yeah, answering with a non-answer. I have a lunch date. Uh, with who? With uh, her new husband. And John doesn't know how to respond. He's taken aback. Uh, a couple of jump cuts here. I had a moment earlier here where she, she's putting on her coat here, her denim coat. The interesting, in the novel, she actually is putting on a mink coat, if I recall correctly. And we changed that to be uh, just a hurtful comment by John, who places a lot of emphasis on status, on Eleanor, who doesn't and um, is putting on a functional, and in my opinion, pretty nice looking uh, denim jacket there. So this shot used to go on a little further. It had her in frustration swinging her arm and purse and hitting that lamp on frame left, and there was a uh, uh, continuity break where we cut back to the very same shot of the lamp back in its correct position after being bumped around. That was me trying to do another one of these, um, you know, continuity for the sake of emotional truth type of things. And uh, that one is a little less effective uh, than the others, I feel. Not saying the others are entirely effective either, but um, I would rather that a movie be overly creative than overly bland. And so um, that's why we choose to take a number of chances in this one. Uh, but uh, the, yeah, we didn't need the whole lamp continuity break thing. Um, I think it flows a little better uh, as is. And we already have three elliptical edits and her saying, I have a lunch date, putting her coat on, and then putting her makeup on right there, we break again. Um, and that's a continuity break that I think is a little more tolerable. We're looking down on John. We have not done that at all for this movie until now. I'm standing on an Apple box with a camera because John's a tall guy and uh, looking down on him because um, he no longer is holding the, the cards here in terms of emotional dynamics. Uh, this shot, um, I have to share, I'm a little proud of this uh, shot we're about to see. It, uh, it runs for a while. We follow them into that corner of the room and then follow them back out. Um, they exchange sides of the frame a number of times. They exchange the proximity with which they share the two-dimensional frame a number of times. Um, we, we step back to include John's hand, talking about um, he doesn't know how to make a drink. We, we push in, and uh, there's a moment uh, coming up here where they're on just the extreme far edges of the frame, um, as befitting uh, their emotional distance. And then we come in again for Eleanor's reaction. Again, I would ask you to take in her performance there. Um, exceptional, if I may say so. And uh, she is being vulnerable herself now. She's saying things that are truthful, as is, is her wont, and uh, John doesn't know how to react to that, um, other than to criticize it. And start belting out quotes. This time, I think, a pretty appropriate one from Auden. Um, now, those were some cross-cuts of um, just straight up cutting to who's talking. Um, totally going against my whole uh, Soderbergh and the so uh, a Solaris remake thing. And because um, I think there's a there's a benefit to doing a sort of staccato exchange there where these, these people are stressed, they're amped up, they're having an argument. We can emphasize that with some quick cutting. And uh, when you're cutting quickly, information has to be processed faster, which means it needs to be simpler. And so we're just cutting on who's talking. He's saying this, he, uh, she's reacting, he says this. Uh, I, I hope it's not too annoying to hear me say that I, I like, I gosh, I like the lighting on this shot. And part of that is thanks to um, Mr. Rory, uh, our lighting guy, who was a pro and an extremely fast and capable individual. Um, there are many ways to do lighting. He was so expedient. And I appreciated that because I like to shoot a lot. Uh, the, the, the wide angle distortion here is something I enjoy, um, especially in contrast um, to the shots of John. So John enters the frame here and then says this profoundly hurtful thing to Eleanor. Again, I hope it works okay now that we've eliminated some of the other hurtful stuff um, that he said in the earlier kitchen scene that got cut. Um, this is uh, 26 take 12. We did um, about 30 takes of this. This is take 12, which I like the most. Um, 
because of Eleanor's response and John's response to himself here. He realizes he's gone too far. What he's saying there is, where's your lunch? Um, I don't think it's very important that we understand what he's muttering there, but uh, that's him trying to apologize. That was another continuity break. We have a still shot of Eleanor uh, before, while she starts talking um, with her, uh, but the shot is her still with her mouth closed because it's a visual um, intimation of her exasperation as she launches into this terrifically performed monologue, which is an alternate take. This is not the same take. Um, we did, uh, gosh, we did 10 takes of this. Each was excellent. It was interesting to see her sort of progress from take to take, not in terms of quality, but in terms of choice. Uh, the, the very first take, she does pretty much exactly what I had asked in terms of we had spent a lot of time talking about this monologue and how it's supposed to be delivered and moving around in the room and so on. This is take two, where she does... I think it's her doing the monologue as she conceives of it. Her idea of the monologue is better than mine is. I like to get to the point of rehearsals where we spend so much time developing characters that the, uh, at the end of the day, the actors know more about the characters and their dynamics and their psychologies than me, the writer, does. And um, uh, you can trust their decisions completely because you've articulated exactly what you're looking for and they've they, being the performer, will know more uh, than you do in terms of how to convey that. Yeah, she is doing things here. She changes, um, gosh, there's a couple of word changes which I realize aren't going to make sense unless I, unless we're comparing this to the other take that was used. Formerly we had used um, take nine, which is actually the tenth take. It was misnumbered. But uh, the uh, last take of the film I was very happy with because it was correctly exposed and it was an excellent performance. This is not correctly exposed, it's overexposed. It's a stop higher because I was worried about accidentally underexposing everything and I wanted to have one take that was one stop uh, more open. But uh, again, yes, some cinematographers are going to be watching this and they're just going to be having heart attacks. Um, myself partly included because there are parts where her face gets blown out. Um, but again, it's about the emotional truth here. It, it is undeniably a better performance. And um, that's what the lion's share of the audience is going to be thinking about. And I think it's, a, it's more naturalistic. It's more dynamic. Um, there's this terrific moment later on where she pauses for quite a while before saying you and your bottled water. And uh, that emphasizes the single take nature of this uh, monologue a little more strongly. And um, she changes a couple words and switches the order of a couple things, uh, which I appreciate. It's more real. I wish I could show all 10 takes of this monologue, though, to everyone because it's a phenomenal um, experience to bear witness to all that, uh, the uh, complexity and dynamism of acting choices. So one question that sometimes gets brought up is, why doesn't John interrupt her? Uh, my answer is twofold. He does try to. Um, there's a moment where her, we hear his voice start to come in, and she interrupts him and continues her sort of tirade here. Another is that I think he recognizes that he's gone too far with that penis line. That was a bit excessive, uh, even for John Fantasia, or excuse me, Vincent Arsenault. The, the, the character names, by the way, are... Um, we uh, did the etymologies on them and researched uh, what names would have been popular baby names when these characters were born. Do the etymologies um, thematically relate to um, the characters and their backgrounds and perspectives? All that stuff is intentional, and um, I have fun doing stuff like that. Her hand against the black, um, little things like that. Contributing visually the uh, overexposure on the right, but the correct exposure of the reflection of the windows on the left and the door on the glass door panels. Things like that are exciting to me. Um, things like her, the detail on her uh, headscarf and her face losing detail there because it's blown out are not exciting to me. However, um, as I've said before, it's like the Richard Burton monologue in Virginia Woolf um, after the first act. Uh, it's out of focus. No one cares because it's Richard Burton doing his thing. A uh, question that I suppose should be answered is um, why did I keep coming back to this film? Why did I return to it um, five years later uh, after thinking that I had, you know, pretty much done the best I could and so on? I thought it was worth it to, for the sake of the quality of the work that these people put in, 
I'm, I'm speaking of the actors and uh, below the line, everyone just put their all into this. And it's a, um, it's a set of characters and a narrative that I feel really strongly about and that I think is good and um, hopefully useful for some viewer out there who's in a problematic relationship. By the way, I kind of want to add that we were... It's been an interest of mine to do narratives with female protagonists for ages. It's, it's, I enjoy that that's very much in the public conversation now in cinema. It was not in uh, 2008 and 2009. It's, I hope it doesn't feel, you know, borderline opportunistic um, to be, okay, here's a thing about a strong female character. Um, no, we were doing this way prior to the discussion of uh, this year and some of last year. Just, I'm just, it's hugely fascinating to me for a number of reasons. Okay, here we are looking down on John again, um, because it just wouldn't make any thematic sense to be looking up at the guy at this point. He's just been beaten down. This is a film about two characters, one who starts off not saying anything and ends up saying a lot, and another character who starts off saying a lot, talking a lot, and ends up being silent. And that's, that's sort of the X trajectory that I map out these two as having. There are two shots in this movie that I think are more important than any other. One is the monologue, the other is this one. We did about six takes of uh, John's reaction here. He's pretty consistent. Most of the takes are, are uh, they're very good, but they're comparable. He chooses what he's going to do and then he does it. And um, this one was uh, the best of them. Yeah, what can I say? Yeah, it's material that I felt strongly about and that I thought was good enough to um, continue working out until I felt great about it, uh, which is how I feel. This is, I feel good about what uh, this uh, result has, has turned out as. Um, it's been nice to step away from it and come back to it. Speaking of number of takes, although I do like to do a lot of takes and there's directors I admire who do tons of takes, uh, I tend not to go over 30 takes just because if uh, we're at that point, there's probably something wrong with the script. But it's, I just, I do care a lot about nailing it and getting it down in terms of performance and in terms of photography. And I hope that there's enough uh, like attention to detail and attention to the macro-micro uh, on all sides of this to be interesting for the viewer. Uh, we have him slowly exit here. He realizes there's no chess moves left. That's her uh, victorious. Eleanor as Victor there. I think the overexposure of um, this uh, monologue take two is thematically appropriate and especially in light of the amount of contrast we have with this fairly dark uh, image here it should be bright it should be hot she should be you know white hot um as she finally gets to this place of being able to express herself with confidence with skill so i don't feel too badly that that shot is overexposed. We've addressed quite a bit of that exposure uh, in post and brought down the level so it doesn't look as hot as it uh, does in raw. Um, so I like this because there's three um, things to look at. There's the uh, framed image uh, to her right, there's her, and there's this um, gilded frame here. Um, we did these takes with her listening to music, not the score that you're hearing now. But uh, sometimes it helps to have music on set. It does something. Ephemeral. I don't know how to put it into words. She looks at us um, at the conclusion of this shot. Following that is, of course, the title of the film. It was always important to me that the title is a verb, possibly a command um, suggested to the audience. This is something you can do. This is her doing it. Yeah, taking control and so on. Uh, we uh, cut out about... 11 minutes all told. Uh, 38 minutes was the original runtime. This is 27. But a lot more has happened than eliminating moments. There's, uh, there's new footage in here. There's trims left and right. Um, almost every shot has had something happen to it, whether it's been moved or, or you know, a frame off here and there. We got into sort of a fastidious, um, over, over fastidious obsessiveness in editing. I love editing. It's where it's, you know, it's the final rewrite. It's where you make the movie. It's what separates cinema from other art forms. 
ju juxtaposing moving images, and so I, uh, I like to take my time with it, and yeah, I wish I could give you exact figures for, you know, we, uh, we affected 76 shots and did this. Sadly, I don't have that data. Thank you for watching and listening to this gargantuan commentary of mine.